Okay. If there's a space to your left, can everybody shift over? Um, <coughs> Hi. So, um, all right, so this, this talk is a very short introduction to NetMap and how you can use it to implement uh, virtual network functions. So what is NetMap? We have been talking about DPDK, PFRing, XDP, and so on. So NetMap is just yet another other independent API to um, uh, access di for direct access to NIC, transmit and receive functionalities in user space. So the use case is the very same as DPDK and PFRing and so on. And the idea is that you have a NIC and you open that in NetMap mode. And once you do that, you are able to temporarily stealing that from the network stack and use that with a very batch oriented and, and efficient API for fast application, networking application. So it's very important to know that this is implemented within the operating system kernel. For instance, differently from DPDK. Should I louder? Try to speak louder. I'm really louder. OK, OK, sorry. Uh, this is implemented in the, within. Uh, operating system kernel, and we will see why this is important later. It's included in FreeBSD and also in NetMap, as, also in Linux, as an auto tree kernel module. So uh, these are the design principles behind NetMap. I think those are important uh, because of the very same design principles uh, also behind the things like uh, DPDK to some extent and uh, and <coughs> Uh, DBK, PFRing, uh, and XDP. So the first and most important one is budget operation. So the idea is that whenever you want to talk to the NIC, for instance, to tell the NIC to transmit packets and receive packets, you, know, you need to um, do that. Uh, you need, for instance, to tell the NIC to transmit many packets at once, because talking to the NIC is expensive. And in general, when you packet, do packet processing, whenever you have fixed costs like locking or lookups, try to, 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 to do, to, for instance, take, take a lock uh, and process with that many packets. This is important because the fixed, fixed cost can be amortized over many operations. The second principle is pre-allocation of packet buffers. So in, in essence, try to avoid dynamic allocation of packet metadata. Like, for instance, in Linux, you have a buff that you need to allocate, and you need typically to allocate and deallocate buff metadata structures for each packet that you process. Third, zero copy access to packet buffer. So the idea is that your application should be able to directly read and write packets in its other space, and the, the, the NIC um, can DMA Packets, for instance, directly in the application as a space. So you don't need uh, the traditional copy across user kernel boundary. Fourth, kernel provides the protection. It means that um, your application cannot crash NIC, your application cannot crash the system. So, uh, for instance, in NetMap, you, uh, the application cannot have direct access to NIC registers and uh, uh, rings. This is very important because all the protection and isolation you need is provided directly by kernel. And last, uh, you, you must have the possibility to uh, use full synchronization. So um, for instance, frameworks like DPDK rely uh, on uh, busy waiting, even if there are other options. But um, with both NetMap and NDXCP, you are able to actually use standard synchronization means like all system calls, select system calls, who can wait for packets to come or wait for egress space. More on this later. So the, the data structures used by NetMap are very simple. There is a, a NetMap interface, which is just a bunch of pointers to NetMap rings. Uh, rings are uh, basically an abstract representation of hardware queues. So you can have one or more receive rings and, or one or more transmit rings for each, for each uh, NetMap interface. And um, uh, a ring is just a SQL array of descriptors with producer and consumer indexes. And all of these data structures are contained in a so-called NetMap allocator. So the idea is that you may have multiple NIC ports on your machines, and a single NetMap allocator may serve more than a port. So the allocator is a domain of trust, meaning that the only applications that are working on the same allocator uh, must trust each other. If you don't want to trust, just use separate allocators. And the basic idea 
is that you, in order to access those data structures, so basically rings and buffers, uh, you want to open a special device, and then you, uh, you can use an MMAP operation to make those data structures available in, in your application. Uh, so a Neptun ring, as I was saying, is an abstraction of a real ring, the real hardware ring. So what happens is that applications operate on the abstract ring, and then they use a, a special sync operation to sync the state of the abstract ring to the state of the hardware ring. So there are two pointers. This is the abstract ring. There are two pointers here, head and tail. So the, the, the meaning of this pointer is that everything between, uh, between head and tail is owned by the application. So for instance, for receive rings, uh, those are new packets that are ready to be read. Uh, for transmit rings, it's free space that you can use for uh, uh, new egress operations. While the rest of the descriptors in the ring, so everything between tail and head, uh, it's owned by NetMap, it's owned by the kernel. This is an example of how you would uh, process a receive ring, right? So uh, say that your application has many um, descriptors available, many new packets that you can read. It can, for instance, process seven new packets and then increment the add uh, index, while the tail is just read only. After incrementing this index, it can sync. Uh, there is a special I/O control call to sync a receive ring. So what happens, we have two effects here. So um, everything between the previous position of head and the new position of head is just returned to the kernel. It's returned to the system for reuse, so, it, it, so that it can be used for receiving more packets. And if any new packets arrive since the last time we synced, uh, tail is incremented accordingly. So in this case, we received new, three new packets. So this is a very simple synchronization between your application and the NIC. Okay. A very important thing that I was mentioning before is blocking versus busy waiting. So uh, the sync operations for both receive and transmit rings are synchronous non-blocking. Um, and basically they operate on all the rings that are bound to a specific Neton file descriptor. So the basic idea is that you open uh, a NIC in Neton mode, uh, binding a certain, um, certain uh, ring, so you can bind just the DC rings, or just transmit rings, or everything, whatever you like. And once you use sync operations, the sync operations operate on all the rings you bound. You bound. Uh, and you can use sync operations for, to implement busy waiting. So if you want to, if you don't want to um, block. But this is actually not the, um, the usual way you use NetMap because you may want to actually block, for instance, waiting for more packets to come or when you want to wait for more space uh, to, to, to transmit. And you can use uh, the poll system call, select system call, or on Linux even ePoll or KEvent. This is supported. So uh, if, if you, for instance, you want to wait for more ingress space, you would do the poll in event. So this is just a standard synchronization. It's very similar to what you would do if you were using sockets, right? Uh, so far, I've talked about um, NICs, so hardware. But actually, Neton supports many kinds of virtual ports. Uh, virtual ports are important because they, are, they can be implemented, they can be used to implement very fast local IPC communication. So for instance, we have zero copy pipes. The, the idea is very similar to Unix pipes. So you have two ends and you can um, let two processes talk, uh, communicate through the pipe. But the point is that um, you, can, you can use NetMap pipes using the NetMap API so you are able to transmit and receive packets in batches, which means that you can be very, very efficient. And also it's zero copy. It's zero copy because you can just uh, swap the scriptos, uh, as I will show later. And uh, this means that you can have, independently on packet size, you can have very, very fast uh, uh, communication, over 100 me uh, mega packets per second. Of course, this is a benchmark, assuming you are not touching packets. But still, it's an interesting upper, um, upper bound. We have also a software switch which is designed for virtual machines. So by definition, virtual machines, you want 
uh, isolations between two virtual machines, which means that the switch must copy packets when transmitting from one port to the other port. And because, again, because of the Netman API, the, the ability to work in batch, to, um, you are able to actually transmit 20 million packets per, per core, per port. We also support monitor ports for sniffing, so similarly to what you, it's, it's sometimes you have a network application uh, using some ports and you want to see what's happening from a separate process, you want to sniff traffic, you can do that with a special port. Today I'm going to talk uh, mostly about um, the last one, which is pass-through port. So the idea is that you have a network port in the host machine, it can be a NIC, it can be a port of a switch, it can, a, a software switch, it can be a pipe or whatever you like. And um, I want to export this port within a, a virtual machine. So the idea of, uh, this is the, basically the idea of network function virtualization, where you, want, where you want to run your application within a virtual machine. So this is possible with network pass-through, okay. Um, there are two main use cases. So you have a KVM guest, KVM virtual machine. Um, if you pass through a port of a valley switch, of the software switch, this is very interesting to implement a very fast uh, local inter-VM networking. So think of two VMs on your machine that are able to ex exchange up to 20 million packets per second and minimum packet size. So that's pretty impressive if you want to uh, implement some sort of fast uh, packet processing application in your, uh, in your machine. Or you can pass through a, a hardware port. Uh, in this, case, this is a sort of direct assignment that you can, of course, implement using standard PCI pass-through pass techniques. But it may still be interesting because you can uh, implement direct assignment without IOMMU supporting the hypervisor and without actual support for PCI pass-through. So it's just a different way uh, to do the same thing. Uh, from the point of view of the guest, the guest operating system sees a virtual NIC, okay? And the virtual NIC has the very same configuration as uh, the underlying network port. So if you pass through um, a hardware NIC with eight receive rings, you will see a virtual NIC with eight receive rings within the virtual machine. And again, um, there is no overhead in, t in terms of copying because the guest has direct access to the buffers and the rings on the, um, of the real port. So you can do basically zero copy from within the, the virtual machine. Uh, any sync commands so are used, are basically forwarded to the host. So this is an example of application that you may implement with this system. Uh, it's a very simple two ports application. So we have an external port, think of it as a public port on some network, and an internal port. So you want to uh, forward packets from uh, the receive rings of the external port to the transmit rings of the internal ports and the other way around. And when going from the external to internal, you, want, you also want to apply some rules. So, I don't know, depending maybe on uh, um, destination IP or destination port, you may want to drop some packets or select some packets. While on the other direction, you don't want to filter, okay? How do you do that in very, uh, in, in a few lines of code? So this is the, um, the main synchronization logic. First, we open two ports, okay, so uh, the internal port and the external port um, using a simple, very simple library. And then we have a simple pole-based loop, for loop, okay, so this is the pole. So uh, here we have two ports, so we have two file descriptors, one file descriptor for each port. What we need to do in this uh, simple appli forwarding application is to decide to decide which events we want to wait for. So the logic is very simple. Let's take the external port, for instance. So if I have no packets ready to be received on the external port, what I want to do is to spawn in to wait for them, okay, on that file descriptor. Otherwise, it means I have, I do have packets. So what I want to do, since I want to forward on the other port, I just wait for egress space on the other port. That's why you spawn out on the second port. And this is sim specularly uh, for the other direction. So if I, have some, if I don't have any packets ready, ready to be received on the internal port, I wait for them. Otherwise, I, I wait for uh, uh, egress space on the opposite port. And then I call the poll uh, function. When poll returns, it means that 
some events are ready. And uh, so I can forward. And I forward in both directions, right? From the external to internal from the, and the other way around. This is the function that implements zero copy forwarding. It's interesting, what, what, I, what I'm doing here is just a parallel scan of two rings. So what I want to do is I have a receive ring from the source port and a transmit ring of the destination port. I want just to forward a bunch of packets from the receive ring to the transmit ring. So I do a parallel scan. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, with NetPy you can implement zero copy forwarding. So um, each descriptor within the ring has inside, has inside um, um, a buffer index. And the buffer index is an, uh, the identifier of a buffer within the network allocator. So all you need to do to forward from a ring to the other is just to swap the index of the two descriptors. And this is what I do here. And adjust the LAN, of course. I also need to tell uh, NetMap that the buffer has changed because uh, it may need to um, uh, change the DMA mapping inside the kernel. But otherwise, what I wanted to show here is that in a, you can implement some uh, simple forwarding rule in a very elegant way and simple way. So this is the example I, uh, you, you can run. I have a queue virtual machines and two pipes. So uh, I could have implemented a different example with uh, hardware ports, but pipe is easy to do because it's all in software. So I have two network pipes. I pass through uh, one end of each pipe to the virtual machine. So the virtual machine, which is a QMO virtual machine, will see two pass-through network ports, while the other end of the pipe are used for packet generation. So here I, I generate a, um, a stream of packet, and on the other end of the pipe uh, I, I receive and, and so what I measured here with uh, short packets, so 64 bytes, I measured about 17 to 20 million packets per second, uh, which is pretty impressive because consider that this application is implemented with just one thread, okay? Uh, while with uh, full M2 sites, so uh, 1,500 bytes, I get about eight. I actually tried to... Uh, both zero copy and copy, and it's interesting to see that in the in the copy case, actually for very short packets, the overhead of changing the DMA mapping because you need to do that is actually higher than copy. So uh, with short packets, actually makes sense. And this is this is actually the same that Luke was saying before. So with short packets, actually doing things in CPU copy. Once you have something in cache, you can very easily process them. Uh, Okay. I also prepared a very short a comparison between uh, uh, Netflix and DBK. There is no time actually to, to, to go through this. But what I wanted to show here is some, um, mm, some comparison item. So uh, one advantage of NetMap and also XDP actually is that it's very easy to set up. Okay, so um, with DPDK, uh, you need to care about huge pages, you need to care about IOMMU, you need to uh, bind and unbind drivers uh, from the kernel driver to the DPDK driver. While with XDP and NetMap, you, you just have to do nothing. Actually, with XDP, you need some very small eBPF program to redirect um, uh, your packets to an AF XDP socket. Uh, also, the other advantage that you get by reusing kernel drivers is that you can reuse the standard EPRO2 and ATH tool, uh, tools, while in DPDK, of course, you need to uh, rewrite ad hoc tools. Uh, also, the trading model is a, bit, a little bit more uh, flexible because with DPDK, you have uh, a fixed you have L cores, so you write your, your code, and your code is run in the context of a DPK callback on a core. While with Netman XDP, you can, AF XDP, you can basically, uh, integ you can basically open AF XDP uh, sockets or open network ports wherever you wish and uh, um, uh, run your packet processing code in any thread, right? Uh, another advantage, again, of NetMap over uh, DPDK is that you can, and this advantage is actually shared with XDP, is that you get 
uh, standard synchronization tools, so poll, uh, epoll, and select. Uh, actually, with DBDK, you can uh, um, use receive interrupts, but that's a bit uh, harder than just using the standard system calls. Of course, uh, DPDK is an extreme performance, so uh, when I prepare this comparison, it, it's, it's very clear is that if you want the best performance, you must use DPDK, because uh, with NetApp and AFXDP, we are still using system calls, so that has an overhead and comes with advantages in terms of uh, improved isolation, uh, standard synchronization. But if you, all you want is performance, you should use DPDK. Okay, conclusion. Uh, I showed you a very simple example of how to write a uh, simple but efficient NetMap application. Um, I think the design principles behind NetMap are important. They inspire XDP because um, in the comparison it's very evident as many choices taken by NetMap and XDP are similar. Uh, why do you want to use NetMap? It's the biggest advantage, I think, it's easy to set up. Very simple API and standard synchronization. Of course, it's a smaller project than the other project. Uh, and it's easy to integrate with existing application. Okay? Why, for instance, with the PDK, you usually uh, need to write your application from scratch and make your application fit within the DBDK framework. Of course, you can get higher performance. Uh, if you want to reproduce the tutorial, that, uh, this simple setup, you can just follow the tutorial's link, and there are detailed instructions on how to reproduce that, all the code, and uh, get those numbers. Thank you. I'm ready to accept questions. Questions? Thank you. So we have five minutes now before the next presentation uh, starts. So uh, just uh, use the opportunity to remind people that uh, could you please leave Vincenzo feedback through the uh, FOSDEM website. There's a feedback yes, okay. at the end of the link at the end of the talk. And also I will pull up the meetup this evening at the Manga in his uh, bar on the first floor at 9 7 o'clock. If you're exiting, can you please exit from the back of the room? Are you working with the uh, other?